Today we are bringing you the St Kilda 2022 season preview. For St Kilda supporters, it's either going to go one of two ways. Will we get the hallowed September celebration or will it be another year on the highway to hell? I don't have the answers, so I've got the best man for it. From Saints TV, I bring you Jake Batoni. Jake, welcome to Lace Out. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you talk about glory there. It kind of brought a tear to my eye. I'm pretty, uh, pretty desperate for it this year, so hopefully we're going to have a good one. Look, all I'm going to say to all the St Kilda supporters out there is be patient, okay? <laughs> oh. And this is coming from a supporter who had to wait 45 years, one tanking scandal, many, many, many wooden spoons, not as many as your mob, but eventually it will return. So just be patient. Because when the good times roll, you're going to go on for them for years and you'll probably have a dynasty like we will. But before we get into it, tell me about Saints TV because I've been looking you up and I must admit, I do like what I've seen from you. But what are the plans for Saints TV? All the listeners out there, all the Saints supporters who are having me get a bit of a dabble, what can they look forward to in season 2022 from yours truly? Uh, hopefully uh, less rants, less tears on camera. Uh bit more champagne during my live videos. I'll, uh, that's kind of where I started in, in 2018 was I just jumped on a, on a Facebook live at the end of a Geelong shellacking down in Geelong and um, people tuned in and were interested, happy for me to, to share my emotions. And in the end, that got them to share their emotions. And since then, it's just been one new thing after another, podcast, reviews, fan cams, uh, doing a bit more interviews uh, like today as well and getting on other people's podcasts and having a chat and then just general YouTube videos about the club and everyone seems to really love it, which is which is awesome. And look, look coming from an experienced podcaster and uh, supporter of a club that hasn't done too well uh, except for last year, people love the rants. They, when, they, when teams, when our teams win, they don't want to see the happy ones. They want to see yeah. when we go absolutely <laughs> ballistic. So I want you to win, but ballistic works. And second of all, let's be honest, we all get smashed down at Geelong once in a while, so just, it's, it's yeah. okay. All righty, so let's put let's put uh, let's put the Saints hat on here. What's going to happen in twenty twenty two? Because out of all the clubs, your mob is one I can't get a reading on at the moment. I don't know. You could you could set the world on fire, or supporters could set you know mm. a rabbit on fire. Just, I don't know what to expect. So tell us. You know, from what you've seen, from what you've heard, what the insiders say, give us a bit of a, you know, outline for, for this year. Um, well, we've had a lot of changes um, in the offseason. We got Corey Enright in. We got Nick Walsh in. Um, completely changed the way we train. And I've been to a few training sessions, and I was at a few last year. And um, last year's biggest issue for us, and I've mentioned it a few times, is that um, – we just played, we trained to the game plan and we didn't train to get fit. And that's why you might have seen in the first 10 weeks last year where we were just getting blown off the park. Melbourne did it. You should have beaten us by more, I think, in round two or three in Spud's game. You had yep. like double the inside 50s and just couldn't convert. We were gassed in that game against Essendon was the same. Richmond was the same. Coughed up a big lead against Adelaide. Um, we just didn't have the legs. So this offseason, they've gone hard on fitness and secondary is game plan, and I really like that. And from what I've seen from Nick Walsh is he's completely taken ownership of that. And from what I saw at the Interclub, it's the fittest that I've seen a lot of players um, in a couple of seasons. So um, if we can get the fitness aspect of our game right, I think the game plan is there. And you would have seen in the second half of last year, we did end up beating Brisbane pretty comprehensively. We beat Sydney comprehensively. We should have beaten Geelong twice last year. We kicked the first five goals, I think, down in Geelong, and then they just kind of uh, tightened the game up and beat us. Um, and we're only a game and a half out of finals. And that's kind of the one thing I like to tell people is that despite having a pretty down year where we missed Paddy Ryder for ages, Rowan Marshall for ages, Max King in a couple of games, Jade Gresham's only played 12 games in two years, Ben Patton, our, our best small defender, we had a lot of things go wrong, and we almost did make it. So, so far, we don't need much to, to improve, I guess is my point. But, like, 
So far, touch wood, only one injury, and form-wise, the boys look like they're training really well. So I think a lot of outsiders will think that we're probably bottom eight because they don't really know our list that well. But if you look a bit deeper and you, you look at the reasons why we didn't perform last year, they're things that we can fix pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much why I'm optimistic. I Good to be optimistic. Uh, and here's the thing. So you went 10 and 12 last year. Mm. You did finish 10th. Yeah. You had the third best percentage outside of the final eight, which is, which is pretty good. I'd say you were three games out, mm. obviously from a points perspective, but then you still had 6% to make up. Yeah, yeah so that you, was the you're issue. You're three games out. But you're, you're in the right path. You're not too far. Like there was only – there was less – there was probably 120 points over the course of the season difference from what you kicked to what you kicked against. Mm. Uh, but that all came against the Dogs because we lost by 111. Oh, that's it's the Dogs. One game. Yeah. It's one game. But that's – hey, I'm coming from a team that didn't make it by half a percent. There you go. So it, mm. it, it can happen. And I think that's the thing. If you can identify that they are getting fitter, that's where a lot of things – that's where your skills go to – Go to um go go to buggery in games is when they're fit they get tired and they just can't just can't hit targets yeah. and you'll notice towards end of games where like you said you were at for a while and then it'll drop just not fit so if the they're going the other route though, a couple of years ago same with that's, Melbourne that's what happened to us yeah we, we two way running last year was really your thing that's yep. how you beat teams you just didn't stop running and that's how you smashed the dogs and so that's what we've done again the template that's the template you've just got to run and especially if they keep dragging down the to change, which they're thinking of doing again, you're just going to have to be fitter. So exactly right. But we don't. Please, my co-host with the most, Jamie, the J-Dog Wallace, well, actually loves it. When I say we're training footballers, not athletes here, I cannot stand it if we get athletes in and not footballers because we've finally been able to see some real gun footballers come mm. back into the fray. Now, you, if you have a look at your midfield, this is the thing that spins me out. You have a look at some of the names you've got. You've got Hill. You've got Jones. You've got Hannibury. You've got steel. Like there, there's quality four right there, all right? Mm. How many games have that four played together since they've been in? And Crouch, sorry, I forgot Crouch as well too, which was a recent addition. Crouchy, yeah. Gresham as well, throw him in there. He's been out for ages. Um, they have, I reckon you may be a handful, not even. I reckon where they've played consistent game, not just one game together, but give them a month together where they can actually gel. That's the thing I've, flagged with a lot of people last year was we just didn't like we were probably the only club that didn't get our best 22 on the park at all melbourne were the opposite blessed with a good run every week was maybe one or two changes not even we had guaranteed four or five every single week and they weren't at the bottom five players they were the top five players that were coming in and out and you just couldn't get any sort of continuity with that and a lot of that continuity comes down to the fitness side of things as well mm. Players are fitter. They can run games out longer if they're not fit or we try and bring them back too quick. You know, it's Ping City. So we've seen that. Yeah. Jeez, uh, Hannabury, he has been, and I'll say a letdown. Not, I can't even say from a playing perspective. He hasn't even been able to get on the park. Mm. From what you've seen, what's he looking like at the moment? Is he, is he primed? Is he just, we still don't know what's going on with him? Um, he's been training pretty much every session, I believe. So he's been training pretty well. Like when I was there, um, I think it was started this year, late last year. He was there and and seemed to be running pretty well. And he, I don't think he's had any major setbacks. He generally at this time he always has some sort of setback and he misses the first month of footy. But so far, I think he's training. He's getting that sort of fitness under his belt. He won't play. I don't think this week. He didn't play the intra club, uh, but he's on his own sort of training routine at the moment. And hopefully, maybe the Essendon game, two weeks out from round one, it'd be good to give him some time there. Um, and that's the same with the likes of, I think, Paddy Ryder's touch and go for round one. So there's a couple in that boat. Billings as well. Um, but they're all, they've all trained like a substantial amount. That's the good thing. We haven't had anyone that's injured that's completely out of training. They yeah. might be kind of on lighter duties, but they're getting to every session and that's pretty important this time of year. And, you know, you've got people down back like Dougal Howard. Just I love what he brings. So to get yeah. him across from... From Port, oh, wasn't it? Yeah, sensational pickup. With Paddy, and then Ryan, the other end, you are, <laughs> and then you've also got down the other end. You've got Mister Memory with the worst palm tree tattoo ever seen in AFL slash VFL <laughs> history. But that's okay. But then you've also got uh, the other half of the King brothers down there as well too. Now, the better half? Are you going to say that or? Well, the only one who's going to be playing this year, so he would be the better half. <laughs> uh, 
Like he's just he's a he's a beast. Just some of the the footage we've seen of him. I know there was the intra club last week. He was mm. clunking and like he kicked thirty eight goals last year in a midfield that really wasn't delivering all that much throughout the season. The sky's no. the limit with this bloke. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna be. He already is, like, a lot of people still question whether he's going to be a star, but I've seen so much from him already that I know if he stays on the park, he's going to be, he's not only going to be a star, but he's a match winner. You know, he, he's capable of kicking 10. There's not many forwards going around anymore that can do that. Maybe the Kennedys, Mackay maybe, but there's not many. So to have him and potentially get Ben King as well um, in a year's time would be an absolute... Like, that would be an insane situation. I know, right now, Max, I know, having just Max I is, is good enough. I know, but I think Aerosmith said it best, my friend. Dream on, exactly. I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't think yeah. the only other brother that you might get is Bon or Wang, but either you're not going to be getting <laughs> in. But he, you're right. He's 202 centimetres. He's played 20 games. He's kicked 38 goals. So he's, he's averaging two a game mm. at the moment. The sky's – I reckon the sky is the limit. Like, they talk about Harry Mackay. This guy, I think, has an extra – a bit of extra. Love Harry Mackay, but there's just something about this guy that he's just – he just yeah. rockets. He just, and, and if he, he jumps and he takes it, mate, good luck. You'll need a cherry picker to even yeah. get close to him. Well, watch the game against Brisbane last year. He made Harris Andrews look like the worst defender going around. He was marking him everywhere. He did that to – um Wiedering as well against Carlton. He clunked to where Wiedering was literally on his back. It was just his sheer reach that he couldn't do anything. Um, so wait until he puts a couple more kilos on. He's already put more on this offseason, but give him one or two more preseasons, and I reckon he's, he's going to be primed for some huge years. Well, they've got him at 97 kegs right now. He'd be yeah. over 100. Like, you can't be that big in a frame. Yeah. You know, Swizzle stick size, but no. He, I, he is massive, and you've been able to retain him, which is awesome as well too. Yeah. Now, tell me, tell me about your small forwards because we know yeah. how it's going to work these days is that if a forward's out of position, it's going to hit the, hit, it's going to hit the turf. Your small forwards, I know you picked up Jack Higgins uh, two years ago. No, last year, two years ago. I can't remember. Uh, 2020. 2020 yeah. So yeah. last year. So you've got him. He's ready to go. Um, so Snags, and he looked like he was happy for um, running around last year. But who else have you got at that crumbing level that can support him but also – because you're going to have to probably get 60 out of your small forwards for the year, mm. just, the way, just the way the game is going now. So, yep. you know, Higo will probably get his 20, but where you, potentially could you get that other 40 from? I think Higo kicked 27 this year, which is pretty good in his first year, 27-12 or something. Yep. Um, I think he would have been second highest goal scorer behind King, if I'm not mistaken. I'll tell you. In a minute. But who besides um, that, who else is going to be able to, to bring the milkshakes to the yard? We need to get 2020 Dan Butler back. Yeah, he was a, what happened he was to 20, 2020 Dan Butler was all Australian like at one stage. And Should then, have been. He was right. Where was 20? Where we, oh my um, God. <laughs> where 20, what happened in 2021? I don't know. I think, um, I think it was partly him, but I think a lot of it was to do with that we went into 2021 trying to play the 2020 footy. And 2020, as we all know, was the first year of COVID, lockdown, playing away from home, shortened quarters. That benefited him a lot. And I think it benefited our whole team where we just weren't, like I said, fitness was an issue last year. And the year before, shortened quarters, it wasn't an issue because it just, he didn't play long games. Um, so I think last year was his work rate. He didn't get to enough crumb, crumbing positions. He was getting a bit lazy. He wanted to get a lot of the ball out the back and just run into an open goal, those cheap goals. He wasn't working up the ground, then working back and crumbing. Which is the sign of someone who's not fit. Exactly. And someone that's low on confidence, he wanted just easy goals. Um, so he, I think he's got to go back to finding the hard footy and then the rest will come. But you're right. Uh, he, had so 29 he, think, in, he had 29 in 2020 off, yeah. not, off 19 games, so including a final. And then yeah. last year in a full 22, he only had 18. So he yeah, exactly. wasn't the same person. So he was down on output. But even if yeah. you had a look at his statistics and so forth, well, he's disposed. He was funny enough. He was up on his disposals, mm. but down on his output, which yeah. for a small forward, that's it's what goals. we're going to rate you on as well too. His yeah. goals, but everything else was virtually consistent. So, yeah, he might have been getting his ticky touchwood kicks, marks, whatever it might be, but just wasn't getting them near goals. Mm. So yeah, you're right. The yeah. fitness side of things might have been a big, big issue yeah. with that as well. I too. think um, Gresham as well coming back. I've heard he's going to play primarily forward to begin with. 
Uh, and then hopefully the plan is to move him back into the midfield when his fitness is back up to scratch. But yep. I think to begin with, he'll play with Higo and Butler. And to be fair, though, like Gresham, Higgins, and Butler as a three, there wouldn't be many th- like small forward combinations than those three if they're up and about. Right now, there's a few question marks on Butler and obviously Gresham because he's been injured. But if they're all at their best, there's definitely 60 goals in those three. Not to mention... um. We're going to play Jack Billings more forward as well. Not forward pocket, but he'll play sort of half forward flank as opposed to a wing, which will be really good as well. And, you know, he was touted as one of the best players in his draft at that particular time. And and he sort of, he's teased it. And then he just sort of hasn't got there. I remember he played the D's one one game, might have been two years ago, and absolutely tore us a new one. Sydney, um, (laughs) they could be anything. But I reckon, like I said, you know, from what we're talking about, terms of the fitness side of things, that seems to be that Achilles heel. That's that's what usually would take one club to the next. Mm. It's just those injuries that you just, like I said, haven't been able to get that full contingent on the park to, to, yeah. to take it out. From a backline perspective, what are the hopes and dreams from, from your there? Because like I said, we, we've spoken about uh, Dougal Howard down there. Jimmy Webster's down there as well too. Who, who's going to be coming off halfback for the Saints this year? Because that's where a lot of clubs are getting their drive. Mm. And that's yeah, where well, I spoke about last night that a lot of the premiership teams, you need to have two quality halfback flankers to, yeah. to set it up from there. Who are they going to slot down, do you think? Well, I think Jack Sinclair's got one position already absolutely locked in. He finished second in our best and fairest and created, he's, I think he's probably averaging six, 700 metres gained off the halfback flank. He was, not only is he giving us a lot of run, but he's one of our best kicks. He can hit a target. Oh, that, um, that definitely helps coming off halfback. Hit a target. Yeah. You're 90% of the way down there. It's just, mate, you, know, that's, you look at Daniel, you look at Bowie, you look at Salem. Salem, you Look exactly. at all the great halfbacks uh, in the last number of years. They have been the ones targets, yeah. so they need it. Yeah. Um, I think, I think yeah. the other one may, it depends if we stick to the structure from last year, but we did play Brad Hill off that halfback flank as well. So it was Sinks and Hill both running and kicking. And that was quite powerful. But the only downside is that they're not the most defensive players. So to have two players off half back that aren't entirely accountable can leave you exposed on the rebound and exposed. Yeah. So I think my ideal situation would be to have someone else replace Brad Hill, whether it's a Hunter Clark or something. But that's the one position I'm not really entirely sure who locks that down right now. Um, we're missing Caulfield out of the back line. He's injured for the year with the Achilles. Um, Pymore will play that. Dugues full back. Kel Wilkie will be the other back pocket and play small and tall. Uh, could well be a Ben Long trial there who's a hard nut and can run. Um, I think that's I think actually that's been mentioned a little bit for Ben Long going yeah. down there to get, it, oh, to get the confidence up, but he's got the skill level and the capabilities to do something down there, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, I do have to ask about Brad Hill because mm. – You'd have to say since he's come across from Frio, it, he hasn't he hasn't set the world on fire, and that's only from my perspective. I'm not, I'm not speaking yeah. for everybody, but from what I've seen, and I know he's on a significant pay packet. That's not him. His manager's been able to organise that, so I take that totally out of the whack. But what 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 do you see has been the hurdle, or what needs to be done to get the Brad Hill? Now he is 28, so it, but that's not old. That's not super old. He's still got at least a couple of years before Mother Nature catches up. But what, are you, what can you see that he needs to do to get back to where, you know, the Brad Hill that would be like, oh, my goodness, you, you need to put someone on him because he could just slice you apart, mm. which he was doing at Hawthorne, what he was doing at Freo. Yeah, well, I think um, that was pretty heavily publicised last year that, and some people might say that this might have just been a, an excuse that Rats put out there to protect him, but I think Ratten was the first to say that the players weren't using him as much as they should have. And I, I can honestly say that that at times was 100% true. There were so many games last year at Marvel that I actually ended up going to where he made some incredible runs off halfback, breaking on a wing in acres of space. Maybe it was a slightly risky kick, but he went and he bolted and he's saying, put it in front of me, I'll run onto it and kick it. By the time he gets it, he's kicking it inside 50 to Max King. But they... We were at that point last year where we were so low on confidence as a club that we weren't willing to take any sort of risky kicks to set him up for a run. We'd look at him, he'd keep running, we'd kick the other way and he'd be standing there going like, 
boys, I'm, I'm bloody free. Like, kick it to me. <laughs> this happened on so many occasions. There were games where it was he'd get the ball, he butchered it. And, I mean, players have games like that. It's not his fault. that Every player has a bad game. But there were so many times where we just, we just didn't use him when he was calling for it. And hopefully this year that's going to be the game plan. And so far from training, he's getting a lot of handball receives. Yep. Um, and at the in, intra club the other day, he was probably in the top five on ground. He was slicing it up. So um, it looked like he was more on a wing. So for me, ideal situation is to have him on a wing, give him that space again, like an Isaac Smith, halfback. He, he's going to get the ball. He's going to play well and kick it to players. But I want Brad Hill kicking it inside 50. Is he a two-way runner though? Because that's what wingmen have to be these days. Is he a yeah. two-way runner? Because I can definitely see him running towards Glory Town, yeah. but is he willing to go hard well, the other way? I'd like to think so because the one trait that everyone links to Brad Hill is his endurance is ridiculous. Not only is his speed good, but he maintains it for the whole four quarters. So I think it depends on if we're willing to to have him run two ways and, and assume that he's going to defend or we structure up behind the ball in a different way where if he's he's a bit more attacking, we know that we can cover any sort of rebound that might you know, generate a scoring chance for the opposition. So every player, you, you need to know your, your teammate's strengths, right? So if he's running up and his players going the other way, we need to have players aware of that and to, to man that up. If we don't, we're exposed. And last year, we were prone to playing pretty selfishly. The players were just worrying about themselves. Um, hopefully this year, we're just worrying about the scoreboard and playing as a unit. Yep. Um, and Melbourne did that better than anyone, obviously. So. Um, I yeah, think you've got to get that buy-in. They, they all have to be. Yeah. They all have to buy in. I, and even if you have just That's one it. person who doesn't buy in, it, 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 it's just not going to work. Yeah, out. It, that, it is not easy because if it was easy, every every eighteen years would have eighteen different premiers. So it's, yeah, it yeah. doesn't work like that. Now I've got to ask you. We know one of the biggest well, surprises to come out of Trade Week was Luke Dunstan. Now I think mm. people don't that don't know. We know that Jack Steele had a magnificent year, won the Trevor Barker Award, placed highly in the Brownlow. And then the second most votes coming in for your mob was Luke Dunstan, with mm. like 11 votes in 12 games. And then he's, he's moved on. Now, you speak to St Kilda supporters, I know, I know quite a few of them. You know, if I speak to the Caruso boys, and if they're listening, good on your wheels and Marky Mark, they'll go, good riddance, yep, couldn't hit a target if he, you know, Water fell out of a boat and all that sort of stuff. Or, but then you get other people that I love Luke Dunstan and I cannot believe he's gone. Where do you sit and how much of a detriment is he leaving the Saints? And more importantly, what can, he, what can Melbourne supporters expect from someone like Luke Dunstan? Yeah. Um, I guess on the St Kilda side, I wasn't shocked that he left, first of all. I yep. wasn't sad. I mean, I was sad because... He was, the, he was the sort of player that when he ran out, he always played for the jumper. Like yep. he'd always hit the ball hard. He'd, he'd bleed, literally bleed every week. You know, he'd get a cut on his head from throwing himself at the footy like no one else would. He was a raging bull, especially last year. But one year is a very small sample size in a career where he's had so much inconsistency. And people always just look at, oh, but he got 11 Brownlow votes. That's off the space of three games in, in five years. That's not good enough. And Brett Radden's issue with him was his field kicking, his disposal. And it's no surprise that in the games that he played well in, they were games at the MCG away from home. It was wet. It was dewy. He was getting a lot of disposals, kicked a goal, but a lot of the time was getting it and just bombing it forward. Under the roof at Marvel where the Saints want to play fast, they want to slice teams up with, with their the foot skills, and hit targets and play quick. He's too slow. His dispos- disposal is questionable. Um, and the consistency is not there. He's not a best 22 player. Not with Ryan Burns, uh, Gresham coming back. You know, we get Crouch in as well. There's not enough space in that midfield for him. Uh, and, and I mean, it was a surprise for me that he picked Melbourne because Melbourne's got one of the most stacked midfields in the game. Um, but I guess on a Melbourne we, side, we were shocked. Good, we're like, good we'll take you. But it's good depth. He's, he's going to come in. If you're missing a play, if you're missing a Viney, he's the perfect replacement. Get him perfect. in. He'll smash blokes. He'll get the ball forward, and your forwards do the rest. 
He plays a simple game, but it's it's effective for the way Melbourne play. So I'm, I wish him all the best, but I never saw him in our next premiership team. Oh, my very good uh, summary of the move. Now, <laughs> I have to talk to you about this bloke because, Jesus, we, we, we talk about rock hard. We talk about the shine, the polish, et cetera. Jack Steele. <laughs> like I can see the smile on your faces as soon as I mention his name. I know, name. you can't see him. There he's there. There he's up. He's on your wall. Looking good. Where there, all yep. the greats are on your back. All the greats are on your bedroom yeah. walls. Uh, I have to, uh, from, from a St Kilda perspective, what is it about Jack Steele that just says, guys, jump on my back? Because people don't rem- people have to remember, he came from GWS. Mm. So he wasn't someone that was drafted by the Saints who they've groomed. They brought him in. So he was an outsider coming in. And he has just exploded into mm. this, this person of reverence at St Kilda. They, there's not a bad word to be said about him. Yeah. I think players and oh, sorry, supporters from other clubs just love watching the way he plays. Yeah. But from, from your perspective, what does this guy mean to the future of St Kilda over the next couple of years? Everything. I mean, we've been looking for that leader for so long since Rui. You know, we. Gear, gears absolutely love the bloke. He, he did his absolute best. Um, he was a great captain, but in a very different way. You know, he was he threw his body on the line. He had some pretty good games, but Steele is on a different level where he sets the standard. And I always believe that captains need to set a standard. You know, if your captain's yeah, not the I best agree. player, you need him to be pretty good at other factors. You know, whether it's off field or leadership or whatever. But Steely's just got it all done, and I think it's. To me, it's always been amazing that the way he plays, the way he looks, everything about him reminds me of Lenny Hayes. Everything about Jack Steele. Oh, he plays the Lenny. same way. Everyone loves, loved Lenny when he played and still do. Everyone loves Steely. Midfield, like, bull. Um, now captain. Um, Steely's just, I couldn't imagine another player holding up our next Premiership Cup. You know, Rui got so close, but Steely for some reason just gives me confidence that I haven't had in 10 years. And I think that's probably, you know, it's not, not um, anything quantifiable, but it's just a feeling. And that's as powerful as anything, if that makes yep. sense. So going to the footy and seeing Steely in the middle of the ground, getting that first clearance, you just kind of feel at ease that we'll be okay today. You know, he'll, he'll do his best. And there were some games last year that we got pants, but, he had 40 disposals and 10 tackles, and he just, every week, he's the most consistent player the club's had in a long time. Um, so, yeah, I think this year especially, the boys are right on him, and he's a solo captain now, so I, hopefully uh, the rest of the team can follow suit because that's what we've been waiting for. I think that whole two people doing it doesn't. Mm. Uh, I think you just have to have one person leading from the front. Yeah. It's it's not mixed messages, but you just you just have to have you have to have the, the apex, the pinnacle. You have to have the yeah. one person that everything goes through. And you know, teams are now having two, three captains. Mm. Yeah, I just I don't I I've never seen it work. I think the closest might have been Sydney, but out Sydney's is a different culture, so just forget about them. So yeah. <laughs> if we had to look, if we had to look in in the crystal ball, where does St Kilda finish? In 2022, position-wise, best and fairest-wise, those mm. sort of things. Uh, injury-free, I'm assuming. Yep. I would, I, I've predicted us to be um, sixth. It'd be, for me, it's four, probably four to eight, but I would say sixth. I'd go right now sixth. I think in the first 10 or 11 weeks, we play probably seven teams that, we beat last year in a pretty poor year, and we don't play Melbourne twice, I don't think. Um, I think our only double-ups are Sydney, Brisbane, and um, Geelong. Yep. So that's not bad. It's not a bad draw. Um, and I can't see us winning less games than last year. I, I think we've got to win probably thir- 12 would get you finals. I think we're, we, we get 13, 14, you're probably sitting at between six and maybe even higher, depending on the rest of the competition and how games go. Um, best and fairest, it's kind of impossible to go past Steele. Um, yep. Although I wouldn't be surprised if someone like Rowan Marshall 
came out of the clouds. Oh, I think yeah. he's primed he's for a huge got, year. Mm, he's a big unit. Can yeah. can ruck, but also can drop forward. He's, yeah. he's that. He's just that guy that we need to plug a spot down back. Marsh, just sit in the hole, and mm. we need someone to take a spot down forward. Marsh, yeah, we need someone. Oh, just he's, to, yeah, he's, he's, he's a, a star. He's, he's a he's great a player, beast. and I think he's still pretty underrated across the competition. So hopefully, this is the year that um, he he stands up with Paddy Ryder in the ruck and um, and dominates. Well, I think I think most teams are going to probably have to go to Rackman, just based on what the teams that are getting to finals need to yeah. Rackman. If you don't have two. Making it very difficult, and also yeah. a ruckman that can kick goals. Yeah, we've that's got also two of them. something. If you've got two of them, it makes yeah. life a lot easier for you. Now, who's going to be the breakout star? Who's going to be the one that nobody sees coming from St Kilda? And by the end of the season, excuse me, by the end of the season, they're going to go, "Whoa, wow, wow, we wow." Where did this guy come <laughs> from? Uh, I'd probably there's a few. I mean, I'm a big fan of Ryan Burns. I think he's primed for a big year. But Cooper Sharman's probably one that not many people have spent much time watching um but he came on we got him in the mid-season draft last year and he played the last four or five weeks averaged two goals a game and was very much like a jack gunston in that he's not the biggest bloke he's tall but he's not the biggest bloke in terms of his size and he just happens to find the right spots and he knows where to run when to lead in his first game he was doing double double up leads where he'd run up to the ball turn run back to goal and then sw- quickly swing around and turn again. And for a first gamer to do that um, was pr- was pretty amazing to see. Like, even Max King wasn't doing that. It took Max King a year to really start to learn leading patterns. Yep. But Sharman just came in and just naturally did that. Just got it. And he's a brilliant set shot. He doesn't miss left foot or right foot. Um, so I would not be surprised if, you know, if we do climb the ladder pretty rapidly, that he would be a big reason as to why we do. So, tell you what. St Kilda supporters, if you're not getting on Saints TV, you're an absolute <laughs> nutter. Jakey boy knows what's going on. Now, who's going to be the breakdown? Who's going to be getting the tap on the shoulder from Rats? And I'll ask you about him in a moment. Who's going to yep. be, uh, I think it might be their last season. There's one guy I'm thinking about that I'll throw in I there think, in a moment. Well, obviously, I think um, Jaron Geary's probably going to finish up soon. Um, Paddy Ryder, we think maybe this will be his last season, depending on his contract. But... Maybe you're referring to someone like a Seb Ross? Uh, not that... Seb Ross. No, not I was Seb looking Ross? at Dean Kent. He was one that Dean I'm Kent. looking at going because he hasn't been able to get on the park. He, mm. It was another example where he left Melbourne to try and get some more midfield opportunities. He hasn't just been able to play consistent footy. He played his probably no. best game against us a number yeah, I remember of years that. back. Yep. It was at the G. Yep. Um, and it's just, I, I don't know. You're getting yeah. a bit old in the tooth as well too. Mm. Is he yeah. a good backup? Because you still need to have your backups. That's what teams don't understand or people may yeah. not understand is that you need to have 43, 44 players on your list. It's not just about the best 22. You need to have that depth. Even if they don't play, you need that you know, break, cut, break glass in, in case of an emergency. Mm-hmm. He's a perfect example for that. He's not going to be best 22 every week, but if you do have a couple of small forwards go down, he's out. But you mentioned Seb Ross. He could be one. Yeah, I think Kent Seb Ross is one yep. that um, someone like a, a Burns is going to be looking at. This year and thinking, if you don't play well, Seb, I'm going to, I reckon I can steal your spot. And Ryan Burns has already proven to be a very good kick. He can run both ways. He's very good overhead um, for his size. And that's something Seb isn't. And Seb's, like Dunstan, always had that question mark on on his disposal. And there's been too many games where he, he gets 30 disposals. He's running inside 50. Max King's got a couple of meters and it's a floater and it kind of either goes over his head or dangles in front of him and hits the deck before it gets to him on the full. So I think, again, I can't really see Seb, unless things change and we re, I don't know, rearrange his role and turn him into a tagger or something because he did that a bit last year and the year before. He tagged Lockie Neal in 2020 and kept him to zero clearances, which was the first time I think in Neal's his, in his career in seven years or something. Um but I really don't see Seb in our best 22 beyond this year. With the youngsters that we've got, Bytel as well, there's a few good um, midfielders coming through that could really plug that, that hole where Seb might, um, might leave. But I wouldn't say he's going to retire, but it could be trade bait next year depending on what we want. Um, he could probably get a, I don't know, third round or a second round depending on his two-time best and fairest winner. Could be some currency there, but you got to you got to be able to play to win best and fairest, regardless yeah. regardless if it's a, a crap team 
awesome mm. team. You've got to be the best of what's at the club at that particular stage. So yeah, absolutely. He's got the credits on the board. It's just a matter of if anybody else wants to, to spend yeah, those credits or take it. them as well. All right. I have to ask you about this guy because he's Brett Ratton. Mm. Thoughts on Brett Ratton? Is there pressure on him? I know it seems to be from a media perspective, but what about from a supporter's perspective? I know you want to get back to Glory Town. You want to get the cup. Mm. He was brought back in, second chance. What What's the pressure on, on Ratton? Is it there? Is it you know, 12 o'clock? That's how much trouble he's going to be you're in, or is he about 6 o'clock? Yeah, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. We know where we are. Mm. Um, I think he's probably at seven or eight o'clock if we're going by that. Um, yep. I, I'm not putting too much pressure on him just yet. Yep. It's obviously like we haven't even played round one yet. So let's see how we go for the first six or seven weeks and then we'll adjust. I think the main issue last year that kind of raised a few red flags for Saints fans was um, the lack of plan B, plan Cs in games. We really had the one style that we went into games with. And if it didn't work at quarter time, most other coaches you'd kind of expect teams would adjust you would play more defensive you'd you'd swap players around positionally but we really would go out every quarter get battered and just continue to do it and we're wondering why is you know why are we playing josh battle on a wing and keeping him there he's a key defender or key forward play him somewhere or why haven't we brought him by tell there were a lot of question marks on decisions that he made but particularly the plan b and plan c you need to have multiple gears when you're playing games we had literally like first gear second gear and after that was nothing you know you need to have multiple you crashed and um when you're not winning everything looks worse you know so i think oh we, we both know about that we, absolutely we, 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 yeah good yeah one, when right? you're not winning <laughs> everything looks yeah. worse and when you're winning it just covers over the cracks. Doesn't yeah. matter if the house has fallen down. We're winning. Doesn't really matter. All righty, let's go through it. So we're putting our agates on the on the chopping board now. <laughs> All right, Jakey. Now your premier out for twenty twenty two. Who's it going to be, and why? Um, I've really got it down to probably Brisbane, Melbourne, or Port. I think I feel like Hinkley's under some serious pressure if he doesn't perform this year. Yep. Um. But it's hard to go past Melbourne. I mean, everyone always picks the reigning premier because that's literally the last game of AFL we've all seen is the grand final, and that's mm. when you dominated. So it, you'd have to pick Melbourne. You'd be silly not to um, with the with the list that they've got, the momentum. But I always kind of put forward uh, when I talk about Melbourne this year is that this is the first real year of expectation in a long time. Melbourne haven't had that sort of, We've got to bounce back, you know, in front of crowds now and, un, un, you know, reveal the, the flag in round one against the dogs. Let's see how Melbourne go as the being the hunted. Last year, you were hunting. You had a record to break and you were going out and smashing teams and just playing on sheer emotion. Now that you've won it, you've got to regenerate that. And I think that's a lot harder than people think. So I'm curious to see how Melbourne go, but they would be my pick. For it's now? kind of funny when you said there was no pressure on us. Trust me, we've been putting pressure on them from probably since at least 2017, 18, when they made finals. They mm. didn't make finals. They ch So there's been lots of expectation. They broke yeah. the duck. And I, and I agree with you. There's only one person who picked Melbourne to win the flag last year, and that was my brother who did the Melbourne, the Melbourne preview I... with us. <laughs> and I laughed at him. I said, you're kidding, aren't you? He goes, you just wait. If we have an injury-free season, we're a chance. There you go. That's but you're what right. I've said with us. And, and it's exactly the same. Anything, anything can happen. Anything yep. can happen. All right, your Coleman medalist for the year. Who have you got? Eight. Max King. Kingy. Yeah, I'm really back in. I reckon, I reckon he can kick 50 this year, over 50. Beautiful. Brownlow medalist? Uh, I don't want to go back-to-back -back saying as I'd love to see Jack Steele win it. But hey, why not? Hey, I think, I think the Bont was probably – I don't know, a bit stiff last year. I think he thought he was going to win it with the last couple of rounds. Um, all the cameras are on the Bont, so I'll go the Bont. If he doesn't win it this year, though, then I reckon Steele is coming for it. Well, I can tell you now, he's already been mentioned a couple of times already. Yeah. So you're not the only one who's thinking that as well. And what's a headline? We get to the end of the season. We open up the Hun, the Herald Sun. We turn to the back page, and there's the headline for St. Kilda's 2022 season. What is it? <laughs> Oh, it'd be good to to have like scintillating saints. I like a good alliteration. You can't we'll go wrong that, with that yeah. with the Herald Sun or the Age. So um, something like that would be nice. Yep. 
Very, very nice. Now, I have one last question for you. Uh, I'm doing this with you for the first time. Hmm. It's a bit of a who am I. Let's see if you can pick this. He's not a current player, so he's an older player. Hmm. Who am I? I have a better per average goal-kicking um, record than the following people. David Neitz, Alistair Lynch, mm-hmm. Matthew Pavlich, Kevin Bartlett, Eddie Betts, Paul Salmon, and Brad Johnson. Yet, I will probably never get into the AFL slash VFL Hall of Fame. Yikes. I feel like Milne was, um, is it Milne? It's Milne. Milne? And that will be a travesty if he doesn't. If he has a per game record, then a lot of those players that I've mentioned, and he hasn't been. I personally think he is the best small forward that I've ever seen. Yeah. He's so un- like He was consistent. And, when I, and so I love good. looking up the records. There's another yeah. record that I, there's another player, I think it's like in the top 18 or 19 goal kickers. He's the mm. only one not in the Hall of Fame. And you know, it's you'd Severi- hope that it's Severio one, Rocker. He's the other one that for some reason isn't in there, yet his record yep. is above and beyond some of them that have made it. So Milne loved it. All they remember Milne for is the bounce, which mm. I'm, I'm so thankful I never had to experience. But he, he, you had to worry about Milne, and I just had to, from the football community, we talk about this guy all the time. He is an absolute gun. And we had a question, we threw it out one night, which was, would you take Cyril or Milne? If they put them both up against the wall, who would you take first? I took Milne. Yeah, Milne. Absolutely. Milne, Milne played just, like he was a fo- like a full forward at times. Like he let out. He was good above above his head. Left foot, right foot. He was just the most naturally gifted goal kicker that I've seen. He just knew where the goals were without looking. And yeah, I just can't like the best moment was seeing him kick eleven straight against Brisbane in 05, where the whole crowd was he was kicking it from every eleven straight. That's you know? that's out of control. That out of control. Out of control. And you know what? He's number forty two on the all time goal kicking list. Now you think mm. of the thousands of people that have played this game over many, many years to be sitting at number forty two on the list. And he was playing insides with Rewalt and Gun. Gehrig kicking yeah. goals, taking goals off him. Yeah. I, I love him. But you know what else? I also love you, Jake. Can I tell you, listeners, now, are you a single man or have you got someone special in your life? Yes, someone special, yep. Oh, there you go. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. The great man is taken. But all I'm going to say is, Jake Batone from Saints TV, you have been an absolute gem. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm, I'm buoyant about the Saints. Maybe Good not day. as buoyant as you are, but like I said, if there was a team to surprise, I think, who's outside the eight to get back in, they did it in 2020. There's no reason why they can't get back to 2021. So, Jack Patone from Saints TV. I have one simple question that I need to ask you, and it is this. How do you want your footy? Straight through the big sticks. And you also want it lace out, don't you? Oh, yeah. oh I, thought the, <laughs> I, I thought that was too predictable. I'm like, I can't no, just use that. Anyway, listeners, that's your St. Kilda 2022. <laughs> no, we don't re-record here. That's your, Saint, that's your St. Kilda 2022 season preview. Listen, get on Saints TV. Get on the fan cams. Everybody loves a good rant. Get behind this bloke because he's an absolute star and get behind your team because, like I said, they could surprise you this year. All the best St. Kilda supporters and Jake are a champ. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Place Out. Head over to iTunes and Spotify to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. And remember, join us every single Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, on our Facebook page with yours truly, Christopher Pepper, and the co-host with the most, Jamie Wallace, giving you your footy how you want it. Ace out.